Hello and welcome to Online Worship with Epiphany Lutheran Church in Richmond, Virginia. Today we will hear that God chose us before the foundation of the world and destined us for a life of praise to the glory of God. Today's worship service is for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, which is July 11th, 2021. My name is Pastor Joseph Bolick, and Pastor Philip Martin will appear later in this worship video. We give God thanks for the spirit that gathers us for worship today. A couple of announcements for the life of our congregation. Today is the final day to register for Vacation Bible School which happens next Sunday, July 18. So you can register today by Facebook, email, or uh, on our website and join us for Vacation Bible School next Sunday. Also, we continue uh, with our partnership with Axe House, which gathers uh, materials to help prevent homelessness in our community. And this week we'll be uh, gathering disinfectant wipes. So you can bring those by any time during office hours, and we appreciate that. Our mystery hymn word for today is a word that we'll sing, sometimes a, a word that we don't use as much in everyday speech. And today our mystery hymn word means to dare to do something or to go somewhere that could be dangerous or risky. So as we worship together, if you sing a word that you think means that, we invite you to just type that in the comments below. Our worship continues with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. O oh God, our provider, help us. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your commandments. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, Jesus, the manna from heaven, feeds and nourishes us. Jesus, the worker of miracles, provides for us more than enough. Jesus, the bread of life, shows us God's bountiful mercy. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven and you are loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Amos chapter 7. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophecy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. For you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly your 
second reading is from Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him, and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, She pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, 
I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Welcome to the children's sermon, and I invite children to come forward or at least get in a good view of the, the, the screen because I have some things I want to show you this morning. And as you get ready for a children's sermon, we'll sing our children's sermon song. <clears throat> Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart is glad to say the words, you are holy, God. So this morning I want to show you some tools, and I want you to shout out if you can tell me what the tools are, okay? First one is this one. That's right, it's a hammer. Hammers are used to do a lot of things, and I imagine if you tried to build something like a building or a fort or a treehouse and you didn't have a hammer, it would be very hard to do, right? Hammer, what's this one? That's a screwdriver, it's actually a flathead screwdriver. Again, uh, it's very hard to build things without a screwdriver. What's this? Right, that is a wrench. And this one actually even says on it, Epiphany Lutheran. So we use this wrench here at Epiphany when sometimes we need to build things and sometimes we need to fix things. <clears throat> what are these? Yeah, those are pliers. And these are pliers that can kind of turn or twist something, but they can also cut something. Again, very useful when you're building something. So wrench, or excuse me, pliers. And last, what is this? Have you ever seen one of these? Get it close. What is that? Do you know what I'm holding? Have you ever seen a tool like this before? This is called a plumb line. It's kind of like a plum that you eat, but you spell it differently. You put a B on the end, P-L-U-M-B, plumb line. What do you think you would do with a plumb line? Can you think of how you use this? You don't hit it on anything and you don't chip on anything. A plumb line is something that a builder uses to make sure that a wall is not crooked because this is heavy and it hangs down and uh, when you put it up next to something, like if I, were, if I were crooked, if I were a crooked wall, and you hang this, this plumb line up to me, you can kind of see I need to be straightened out, right? If I sit straight up, the plumb line is straight up and down on me. So you, a, a builder would use this. Maybe he's built a wall, uh, and he wants to make sure the wall won't fall down. He uses a plumb line. This is very, very useful. The Bible says that God wants to use a plumb line with you and me because he wants us not to be crooked. He wants, God wants his people to be straight and be strong and sturdy uh, so that uh, his love, God's love and God's justice will be strong for everybody, right? And so God wants to build you and me with a plumb line to make sure that we're straight, and not just on the outside, but that our hearts are straight and not crooked on the inside. And God does that eventually by giving us this person, Jesus, who's a carpenter. Jesus helps us not be crooked because he loves us so much that he'll straighten us up and it'll take the areas of our life or the parts of our life that we're not proud of or we're not happy about or maybe that aren't our best and makes them straight 
so that God can come and live in our hearts. Jesus is God's example of how to live a straight, a straight life and not be crooked. And eventually, Jesus will die on the cross in order to show us how much he loves us and how much he wants us to be able to be connected with God and be, um, and be built strong and sturdy so that we uh, can share God's love with everybody in the world. So this is a plumb line, and maybe next time, uh, maybe, maybe your, your, one of your parents has a plumb line, if they're a builder or something like that, and you can ask them, can I see your plumb line? I'd like to see that. Just think of how God makes us, uh, takes all of our crookedness away. Can you remember that for me? God bless. Let us pray. Dear God, you are always building us, and you're putting us together the way you want us so that we are not crooked and we can be strong and sturdy for all of your people. Thank you for giving us Jesus, who makes us straight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may return to your seats. God bless. questions that I get asked sometimes by high school students is, does God have a plan for my life? Actually, I've been asked the same question by adults, and if you want to know the truth, I have wondered it too. Does God have a plan for my life? Does God have a plan for our life? This past week, John Hartman has been in Price Hall taking time between visits with his grandchildren and American Legion Baseball, and working on a new project. All week he was there in the gym, sitting behind these two fold-out tables piled high with architectural plans of this building, Epiphany Lutheran Church. He has dozens and dozens of large four-foot by three-foot paper white scrolls laid out all over the tables. Some rolls are like this in huge cylinders. Some are laid out before him under his examining eye. 
All of them looking as if they have been dug up from the Dead Sea or dropped off by Indiana Jones. John is going to digitize these plans that now exist on paper scrolls so that they can be preserved and emailed and referenced conveniently anytime in the future should our congregation have a need to make repairs or do new construction or whatever. The plans that John is organizing are these large maps with mathematical formulas in the margins, drawings and drawings of these structures that we uh, use for our worship and our mission to Christ. All, all the different multiple angles representing all the phases of the growth of this church building. Given that stack of papers in Price Hall, the sheer number of scrolls, the scope of the project, my guess is that it'll take John several months to complete. Today in Scripture, the writer of the letter of Ephesians presents to us the architectural plans of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our God has rolled out the scroll of his ordered creation for us and bestowed blessings on us which no mathematical formula can quantify. God's blessings are simply too numerous to count. Our God has laid out the cosmos, designed the universe, planned for humans to flourish, and provided his grace to us for all the phases of our life. God has made known to us our need for repair and has given us Jesus Christ to restore the breach that our sinfulness has created, making us now children of God. All of this is to say, yes, God does indeed have a plan for our life. God has masterminded the structure, calculated the angles of our life, God in Christ has set us on the firm foundation of his love. God has prepared forgiveness for us and redemption and an inheritance rooted in the promises of Christ. If you were to stop by Price Hall and see the plans that lie on that table, you would know that the architects who created them have moved on to other structures and buildings, no longer really linked to what goes on here now. But the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has built in us more than a building. God has built and is building our life together. And our God is intimately connected through the Spirit, not only to our past, but to our present and to our future. It is wonderful to know that the plans God has put in place before time began go all the way back to before the foundation of the world that God blessed us in Christ and chose us in Christ at that time. But how much one more wonderful to know that even now, God is still with us, extending to us now his forgiveness and redemption. So that what we have been promised has been given. God has made known to us that we belong to him and that he will continue to guide us. We belong to this God who has a plan for our destiny. God will gather up all things in Christ, everything in heaven and on earth, and at the end of all things, we will receive the full inheritance prepared for us. Our inheritance, if you want to know, is that we are made children of God and adopted into a new family of love and peace and joy. One of the great templates for ancient storytelling used in the time of the Ephesians was the idea of an ordinary person adopted by royalty. Ancient life was hard with no medicine and grinding poverty. And a popular story was that of a protagonist discovered that they were actually royalty, somehow separated at birth from their true family, but their identity was discovered and they were whisked away to a better life. The writer of Ephesians uses that ancient trope to explain how we are adopted into a better life in Jesus Christ. A little more modern, this summer, my wife Sarah and I have been revisiting the Star Wars universe a little bit on Netflix. And I have been reminded of another adoption story in the character of Rey Skywalker. 
You know, Rey is introduced to us in the sequel film trilogy of Star Wars as a scavenger who is left behind on the planet of Jakku as a child, later becomes involved in the fight against the First Order. She trains to be a Jedi. She faces the evil forces of Kylo Ren and Snoke and Palpatine. And for most of the first three films, we're left to wonder who she really is. Is she a scavenger and a nobody, as she was told? Or might she be descended from one of the great families of the galaxy? Some people I talked to hoped that she would be of blood relation to the Skywalkers, the greatest family in the galaxy. Other people thought, nah, that's too predictable. I don't want to see that. But, of course, we finally learned that she's not a Skywalker by blood relation. And, in fact, she's actually the granddaughter of the evil Lord Palpatine. But she's adopted as a Skywalker, and she really becomes a Skywalker, taking on the Skywalker name. And so, her life becomes new, one in which she lives in light and truth, really as a Skywalker. We are adopted and given a new identity in Christ. We have a new life that's more beautiful, more rich, more joyful, more meaningful, because we are connected intimately to the one who created us and the one to whom we belong. We are made a part of God's royal family, Beloved, cherished, known, loved, welcomed into the family of light and truth and given a new name. We belong to Christ. All creation has received this very invitation. All people are invited into this new family. Some are aware of God's goodness and are living to the praise of God's glory already. Some have yet to discover this truth. St. Augustine talked about this and used an analogy of two cities. He says there's an earthly city and a city of God, both which exist in the world right now. The earthly city consists of people immersed completely in the cares and the pleasures of this present and passing world. The city of God is populated with people who forego mere earthly pleasure to dedicate themselves to the eternal truth and light now revealed in Jesus Christ, to be a part of the community that Jesus still leads. God's plan for us is to live in the city of God. And in baptism, you have been adopted into the citizenship of this city. We could think of it as two cities superimposed on one another as Augustine imagined. As the writer of Ephesians will say, look, your citizenship is in heaven. In other words, your citizenship is with God. Or we could think of this duality, this kingdom that's here but not completely here, as two parties that are going on simultaneously. In Mark's gospel, we hear about Herod's party, a party that is antithetical to Christ's ethic of love and service and forgiveness and inclusion. And of course, uh, Herod's party, not everyone is welcome. It is a party to feed his own desires, the desires of the ego, a party to celebrate his own aspirations of power and his own family's longing for a dynasty. Their family is really funny in the way that their ego is on full display. You probably know this is uh, Herod Uh, Antipas, not to be confused with his father, King Herod the Great, not to be confused with Herod Archelaus, Herod II, the other Herods, or even Herodias, his wife. Boy, do they love their name, right? At this party that stands in for all the parties of this world that are in opposition to the God of love and care and mercy, Herod displays a lack of morality and a lack of real strength. He is unable to make the ethical decision to save John the Baptist, even though he knows that John is a holy and good man. And Herod can't do that because of his rash promise. He has to follow through on his promise, he feels, because he fears what his guests will think of him if he goes back on his word. Herod's party, the 
parties of the world that do not honor God are parties of gruesome and tragic death, ultimately. But Jesus' party is a party of life. Jesus' party is the real party. It is a celebration of death defeated, death overcome. Jesus' party is the party at which the prophets are listened to and honored. The lame are made to walk. The blind receive their sight. The humble poor are provided for. Those who have been excluded are seated at the places of honor. And God's plan is for you to be at this party, at Jesus' party. In baptism, the cross of Jesus Christ has been made on your life. So that this party, this city, this family, this reality is for you. So that in all the tragedies of our lives, we're able to look to the cross and see that it is empty, robbed of its power. Jesus is no longer there on the cross. Jesus is no longer in the tomb. Christ is alive and he has obtained an inheritance of the riches of God's grace for you. This past week at a funeral in Surfside, Florida, for four members of a family, the Gara family, the priest, the Reverend Juan Sosa, said of that family who died in the collapse of the Florida condo building, for this family, death does not define them because God's strength is always present, especially in trials. When we look to the cross, we see God's plan to make sure that death is not what defines us. Now, because of Christ, life has the last word for us. Our past and our present and our future are in Christ so that we who have set our hope on Him can live now for the praise of His glory. Yes, the love of God in Christ has set the beams of creation in their place and He has plans for our life. God has designed you, your eyes to see, your ears to hear, your feet to step, your mind to process the physical world and to seek and grasp the sheer multitude of gifts given for you. But God also has a specific plan for our existence. As we go to school and work, as we take vacations, as we run errands, as we make friends and suffer hardship, and eat and sleep and wonder. It is to welcome people into the city that we know we belong to. It is to share the invitation to the party that has already been extended to us. It is to tell of God's plans, to bless us with a life lived before God in love, looking to Jesus who holds our life and extends God's grace freely and mercifully. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are God's people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the, and the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord and Father of all humankind, your authority in Jesus Christ, your Son, extends to all people, freeing them from the power of sin. Send us out into the world as missionaries of your grace, announcing to all lands and nations that freedom is known in following your Son, 
Give us the courage to show this freedom through acts of love and self-sacrifice. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of all nations, the gracious kingdom brought about through Jesus' death and resurrection embraces people throughout the world. Teach your church to look outward rather than always inward, to seek out those in need. Teach your church to pray outward so that our actions will embrace rather than ostracize those in pain. Teach your church to move outward so that we may extend your grace to all. Teach us to love outward so that everyone may hear the call of Jesus and all nations will thrive under his reign. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of salvation, you came into the world as one of us and suffered as we do. As we go through the trials of life, help us realize that you are with us at all times and in all things, that your loving grace enfolds us for eternity. We pray today for those suffering in any way, those who are lonely, those who are addicted, and those who are recovering from surgery, especially Jenica, Megan, Jeff, Carol, Anne, Betty, April, Judy, Philippa, Teresa, and those we name silently or aloud before you now. God of mercy, bless those who travel this summer and watch over them as they are away from home. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. God of love, we give you thanks for all the saints and those at rest in you. Pray their lives and witness to others may be examples for us and strengthen us in our mission to spread the news of your kingdom. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, in the name of the Spirit, the three in one, the three in one. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Lift his countenance upon you. Lift his countenance upon you. God's blessing go with you. God's blessing go with you. And give you peace.
Go in peace to walk the journey, worship the Christ, and witness with joy. Thanks be to God.